Hello guys, welcome back to Chaos TV's World Courage, where we play Invitational Round of 16 matchup between Ultravise and Never Give Up. If you have just joined us, it currently resides at 1 to 1, so everything comes down to this game. I met this joined by Spuddington, we are into the picks and bans. Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be an interesting game because the first one was very aggressive, very explosive. We saw fights, we saw inhib trades, we saw turnarounds at Baron and a lot of different stuff across the board. And then the second game was completely the opposite. It was a very slow, controlled pace of game involving an awful lot of poke from Nidalee and just generally control base essentially disengage and running away was the theme of the day but in the end it was a definite victory for never give up they honestly outsmarted their opponents now though we have got the nidalee being banned out as well as the oriana so essentially the two key champions from the first two games were the mid laners and both of them have now been banned out so i'm curious if we're going to be seeing different switch up strategies and there's actually another thing if they do pick teemo by the way he may be now satanically powerful due to the vision changes. Yes, that's that's a very good point. A lot of people were saying this on Reddit as well, that Season 4 could be the rise of Teemo. So it's going to be quite interesting if he does get locked in here, how that's going to work. What we do know, however, is there has already been a pickup of Fiddlesticks on Team Ultra Vyas, which they did go for in the first game as well. Could be a thresh to play against them. Yeah, the other option, of course, is that it could be a placeholder pick, but now Teemo would be a little bit too kind of too legitimate almost because of the, all that things. And it's actually worth noting, by the way, at the start of Season 3, Teemo was ridiculously powerful as well because the introduction of um, introduction of Leandri's Torment synergized so well with his mushrooms just destroyed everyone back in the day. You'd put down like a level 1 mushroom and it would take off some, half someone's health with a single Leandris Torment as item. So doesn't actually look like that's what they've opted to lock in, but it's genuinely an option. He does have some bad lane matchups, but he actually also has some really, really good ones, especially if you run him mid and build him AP. So ooh, it could be interesting, but um, at the moment, there is, uh, then we just have some fairly standard lock-ins. We've got Olaf, we've got Fiddlesticks, we've got Caitlyn. Actually, we haven't got the lock-in on Olaf, but I'd be pretty surprised if they didn't. Yeah, especially as they ran him last time around as well. So they have locked that in and the ship mana. So they're going for a very similar composition here between games two and three, which is interesting considering they did lose game two. But as you mentioned, Nidalee was a big part of that loss. And with eliminating that in the band's phase, definitely less for them to worry about. However, I am quite curious to see what Mazarin's going to be locking in because I wouldn't necessarily say that his Ari was bad in game two, but it definitely wasn't game changing. It certainly wasn't up there with his Oriana from game one. Yeah, I noticed several times he would be pulling the kind of style of play that you see so often out of the really, really brilliant Aries that you see. You know, like diving into the middle to throw out a Q, and then you expect him to jump out, and he's mistimed it just a tiny bit, gets blown up, and just doesn't contribute any further to the fight. That is not something you can afford to do, and Ari now, since the changes, needs you to be a really good player to really make her work. So... It's one of those things where maybe that won't be what they choose to go for this game. Although that being said, the only reason he was being so aggressive was because they had such an onus on them to engage. So maybe he could make it work if they were playing on against different compositions. Regardless though, we have got the final few lock-ins coming in. And it does look like Nocturne is the jungler of choice almost for Never Give Up. Yep, this would be the second consecutive game he's going to be played from Lasagna in the jungle. This time around, Lee Sin wasn't banned, so that was still open and available, but obviously just feeling Nocturne works better overall, plus Kennen as well. So the, the ultimates coming in from the box of Thresh and slicing Maelstrom from Kennen, so much CC, so much damage as well. Definitely one to watch out for. If Deadly Brother does lock in Sivir, it will be the third game in a row that he's gone for that AD carry champion. So very similar, almost identical actually, line up to game number two. Indeed, and now we actually are looking at seeing the Ari mid again. So Mazarin wow. looking like he's feeling fairly confident about that decision. Even though I would say last game it was not the best of uh, things in their team. So, 
full lineup is once again extremely mobile coming out here from Ultra Vias. They have a lot of movement speed, a lot of dashes, but will they be contending with a lot of kiting? Well, perhaps not to the same degree they were last game, but Kennen and Thresh both punish people that are running at them. Same being true of Caitlyn, and I'm interested to see what they choose for the last lock-in. I'm not actually joking right now when I say... Timo could be a legitimate pick right now if he was an AP Timo mid. Yes, it definitely could be. The only difference, uh, just in case you have joined us, between this composition for Team Ultravise and the last one is that Sona was in instead of Fiddlesticks. Everything else is the same, which suggests to me, Spuddington, they were happy with their composition. They thought it was a legitimately good comp, but it just didn't work because of the Nidalee. So this, they're feeling confident still. Ziggs has been hovered over. Would not surprise me if it gets locked in. Is a top tier mid laner right now. And that obviously will signify it's going to be Kennen at top. Boring people, not running the team. Oh, as, as it happens, though, <laughs> with the Ziggs, that does make a lot of sense. And once again, it looks like we're seeing a fast engage composition with the severe ultimate with the olaf ghost with his ultimate as well and shivana running in very very similar stuff as you mentioned from ultra Vias going up once again against a really siege and poke orientated composition it looks like they do not intend to give any kind of team fights if they can possibly avoid it at least at least being aggressive with them so that does lead to the questions of what are the lane matchups going to end up like? Probably top lane going in their favor, mid lane very equal. Bot lane, I would actually also once again say will go in the favor of never give up. But let us, if you have any final th thoughts, now is the time to say them. Well, I don't really have too many final thoughts on the game in question, but we do have a giveaway going here at Chaos TV through Well Played. So if you are interested in winning yourself a G300 gaming mouse, go ahead and type in exclamation mark giveaway in the chat and it will notify you what you need to do, what the next steps are to put yourself in contention to win that G300. But while you guys do that, we're going to cut to a quick commercial break in this delay timer. When you rejoin us, we'll be live for the third and final game between Ultra Vise and Never Give Up.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the, uh, nope, the We Play Invitational Nilly City EOS, EOS Challenger Series. I am Spottington, joined by Metas, and we are into Game 3. We are. It's going to be Team Ultravise against Never Give Up. 1-1 one one is the scoreline. Everything to play for here in the We Play Invitational round of 16. So the winner of this will be going through to the quarter finals. Actually, already a flash burnt away from Archie as he found himself in a really sticky situation with the entirety of Ultravise chasing him down. So flash with the support's not going to be up. And that could be what they needed here, Team Ultravise, to go ahead and just camp the bot lane. Yes, indeed. That does mean that you've got some really quite seriously exposed characters. Thresh does not have very many natural escapes. Generally, very, very difficult indeed to keep himself alive. But one of the interesting things right now is that he's actually started with two biscuits, which is two health potions and an ancient coin. He's got the sweeping lens. Yeah, uh, no, he's not. He's got the boarding lens. Uh, so uh, it's not lens it's totem i'm gonna just the second word is irrelevant he's i'm just gonna start calling them trinkets so he's essentially planning around the fact that he's probably going to end up in a 2v1 lane they have swapped this up but it seems like they have been called on that and they are going to end up in a two on two with very little warding this is dangerous in fact on both teams parts very little warding and no flash so this is going to give ultravise that little bit more opportunity to make a lot of plays happen because of the lack of flash that archie now possesses so two versus two lane top that is of course going to leave a one versus one lane at a bot and again we're seeing a very similar opening here from ultravise that mbs lol is just going to follow a lunar x around the jungle for the first few levels and then go to bot lane Indeed he is. I am actually a little curious right now, by the way, about a little thing that probably wouldn't be mentioned in the patch notes. Can you see if the opponent has used his trinket, if it's just gone on cooldown? I didn't spot that in the, the patch notes, but I would assume you can. I'm not sure, though. All right, because if so, that would mean right now that Archie may have actually signed both of their death warrants because he walked into the brush below very, very obviously to put down his ward. And that could be quite dangerous to do uh, if your opponents see you walk in, see you walk out, and they notice your totem has gone on cooldown in that time because that just says, okay, the ward is here, and we already know he's only started with one. Yeah, that's, that's very true, but... It's just a question of whether the players are going to cotton on to that fact. Death Sentence comes through, doesn't quite land on Deadly Brother. It's not able to put any harassment down. But as you'd expect from a Caitlyn Thresh laid against Fiddlesticks Sivir, they're pushing very, very aggressively. And they're looking to keep the tempo, keep the plays in their favour. Ward goes down from Yanwa. But Nocturne's nowhere to be seen, so they're not trying to, to gank this top lane. Neither jungler seemingly too interested. Aluna instead is going to be going to mid. Yes, indeed, and he may actually end up in close combat with Ziggs, which, Satchel Charge notwithstanding, could be dangerous. He does get the spot out there. So, looks like there is going to be a return to this top lane from Corellius and from Deadly Brother, but they're really having a hard time at the moment, and it seems like the fact they got called on this swap up is actually getting quite painful for them, because Sivir pushes faster than Caitlyn, but in this environment, 2 on 2, she doesn't have much answer to the auto attack range. Death Sentence lands on the flares. Well, look at the burst damage. My goodness. Deadly Brother just came back after recalling as well. So that couldn't have gone much worse, honestly. And that's uh, going to put him in a really bad position because now his creep wave is pushing and he can't afford to get even close. If another Death Sentence lands, he could be dying. And I'm pretty sure I just saw Caitlyn flash. Meanwhile, though, in the mid around Dragon, we are having a two versus three engage as Olgate is forced to back away. But going back to what I just said, Caitlyn just flashed into a bush randomly. Important. You have to get out <laughs> of dodge. Right now, there is um, an invisible Teemo in this lane. Okay, so... Doesn't really matter, and MBS LOL, by the way, just having to do a big, big long circuit in order to avoid his own death. And I also feel like I may have missed a serious, um, uh, a serious pun opportunity before when I, when I said he may have signed his own death warrant. Could have just said his own death sentence. You could have. Uh, didn't. But bot lane spot there could be an engage on mbs lol who's in enemy territory right now he is being chased down by nocturne and also ken and ignite comes out is forced to flash away and with a burnout should be okay but still summoner spell was burnt in the process 
Yes, indeed. And it looks like Lasagna intends to keep ganking in this bottom lane right now. Power of Dreams. I'm actually a little bit surprised he's having as much difficulty as he is. Last couple of games, he has ended up getting advantages early on simply because he's in a good matchup and he's very good at playing them. But this game, in spite of the fact he's against a melee champion without sustain, he's having an awful lot of difficulty. He doesn't seem to be able to just stun Shivana up and walk away as you would want to do normally in a cannon lane. It just isn't working out for him. However, Olaf in the top lane, unable to get anything done. Well, speaking of difficulty, the CS difference between the two AD carries is around 20. So already you're seeing that Yunwa is getting ahead of Deadly Brother. He's, uh, he's suffering, he's had to recall as I said, then came back and got chunked down to nearly no hit points, had to recall again. So that's definitely one of the main reasons, but Caitlyn has yet to go back to the spawn and uh, is already looking really beefy. Yeah, this is now looking really quite scary, and I think actually also an interesting point, uh, if he hasn't ever gone back to the spawn, how does he have a pot? Maybe he's running utility masteries. I don't know. I, I believe so, yeah. Up. It's interesting because I was I was talking to, to Pulse about masteries before, and he seemed to think that even as an AD, there may be a lot of reason to go into utility tree because the, the AD offensive room page isn't necessarily that important anymore. So it's going to be interesting as the season chugs on, as the preseason chugs on as well, to see how these ADs, the mids and such... Like, just approach this masteries pages, yeah. I should say. Indeed, it, it, it's just one of those kind of interesting things. They did actually change Doran's blade, though, apparently, which is something I didn't notice in the um, in the patch notes. So, once again, an unfortunate thing there. And uh, Archie pulling an interesting play, deliberately missing Death Sentence to avoid Deadly Brother getting any mana. Uh, Deadly Brother himself is getting poked down quite a bit, but it seems that the sheer boomerang blade throwing out now is starting to actually bite into them a little bit. Archie doesn't have any pots and he is slowly losing on health. The thing is, even if Doran's Blade has been reduced, as obviously it has, and that would allow a health potion, that still doesn't really change the point that we're making though, Spud, that utility may actually be a viable way for ADs to go through their mastery pages. So again, it's the first day of patch 3.14 being released. Players, teams, they're going to come up with different ideas. Things will inevitably change as this progresses through. And we were both very interested going into the first game of today's proceedings as to how both these teams were going to come out the blocks and really approach this game. And it's interesting to see that by and large, it's been pretty different. Yeah, indeed. They, I mean, the compositions themselves haven't changed too much. But the warding game has definitely become a lot deeper and kind of more involved since the uh, since the changes. But uh, right now, it feels like both of the teams are actually having quite a bit of difficulty getting any ganks off. And that, well, honestly, that's going to make, make the new changes quite important. You can see, in fact, I think... Well, actually, no, Nocturne went for Spirit of the Ancient Golem, or at least he looks like he is. Alan, however, went for the Madrid Razor, so he can do a lot of farming. Yeah, Power of Dreams gets that undertow on his backside, now being chased away, forced to flash. So, basically, that is going to be another Summoner Spell burnt. Lots of aggression from both these junglers in the very early stages of the game. Well, yes, indeed. And actually, uh, Charm in the mid lane, Mazarin going aggressive. Yes, he is. Uh, another Summoner Spell being used. Ignite's coming down onto Olgate. Going to Satchel charge away. Can Lunarex land the last undertow? No, he can't. Going to be going deep underneath this tower. Does finally get that kill with Mazarin picking it up courtesy with the Orb Deception. Going to be first blood going to Team Ultravirus. And that Ultra, Ultra Virus? Oh no. Ultra virus. It's a pandemic. No, it's uh, this is one of those one of those unfortunate things. No, no, we must we must stop the ultra virus before everybody dies. It sounds like a plot to a Mega Man game. It uh, okay, so doesn't really matter right now. But um, that is a nice little windfall because at the moment across the board, ultra virus are actually suffering. They are getting pushed back in this top lane. Shivana now is starting to have some serious problems with Kennen in the top lane. They need that goal, they need that snowball, and Ari is a very good roamer. She will be able, potentially now, to look to set those other lanes in motion in her favor. Right now, though, she's going to be returning to lane. It's going to be at least 40 seconds until they go for it, because they are going to wait for that ultimate to come up. Fiddlesticks is actually going in, and Lazani's right there. Cross Storm coming through. Archie is taking so much punishment underneath that tower, but they're going to be turning someone back around. 
Wolf one trade, flash from Carolus, and he is going to be okay. But have a quick gander at the CS difference here, Spud, at the top lane. 95 to 50. Deadly Brothers dead. So in that case, Yon was just going to get even further ahead. This is brutal for the AD carries perspective. Yeah, and that's what happens if you end up in that two-on-two -two with Sivir versus Caitlyn. It's really, really difficult to deal with 650 range. But, however, if you can kill him, that works. Yeah, Terrify goes off, but they don't have enough follow-up damage. And Vozani stood right there with a Nocturne with red buff. I don't think Alina X wanted any part of that engage. Yeah, I've got to be honest, I was, I was slightly disappointed by the Reckless Swing, which, of course... Jungle Olaf doesn't max, so of course it does a lot less damage. So I was thinking, ooh, this uh, this will be a big spike of damage, and then they could potentially burst her down, and it just did nothing. So, it doesn't really matter overall, though. Deadly Brother returning to the lane, and now he wants to make sure that Caitlyn doesn't get an easy chance to recall, but he needs to be careful himself to make sure he doesn't end up in that two-on-two -two catch situation, which could occur. But it looks like YNWA is actually going to stick around, farm the golems, and stay in on low health and low mana? No, in fact, which he just wanted that extra bit of gold. Yep, he's going to be recalling with 1.5k at his disposal, plus a BF sword that he's already got. So that's a Bloodthirster compared to the Vampiric Scepter, Berserker Greaves of Sivir. That is a colossal difference in damage. And I have to feel this is going to snowball really hard unless a Luna X can camp the top because Deadly Brother is in all kinds of trouble right now. And I don't think he's going to be given any respite. It's going to be constant harassment, constant presence in that top lane from the side of Never Give Up. Yeah, it is. And Caitlyn with a yeah, Caitlyn with a bloodthirster just does so much flat auto attack damage at this stage of the game. It is the most strong Caitlyn can be at this stage of the game, and she is in one of the most strong matchups she could be in. And you can just see that damage trading happening right now. Deadly Brother is not gonna sustain that up anywhere near as fast as YNWA. That is scary, scary stuff right now. So Again, it does look like Ultraviz are actually starting to fall a little bit behind on the map pressure, map presence thing. But in their, in their defense, at the moment, no major objectives are going down. And with the Bloodthirster as well, of course, one thing we haven't mentioned is you get the stacks. And 30 is maximum stack. So every single CS that Yon was landing is just going to put him further and further ahead in terms of uh, lifesteal and also attack damage. And Deadly Brother just cannot do anything. In fact, is starting off the blue buff... Maybe for Mazarin, I'm not too sure what's happening here. Yeah, we're starting off and then just packs away again. He's got nothing better to do. He's got some lifesteal. He will get a little bit back. And he just can't go anywhere near the creeps right now. Fortunately for him, he does have Mega Mega Wave Clear with the Boomerang Blade and with that attack that's coming in from Corellius. Crowstorm again, almost a carbon copy of last time around, but do they have the raw damage to take this one out? Here comes Aluna from the side, they do get the kill. Deadly Brother picks that one up, so, so important. They could be going one better now, Yunwa being chased down from a ghost, Ragnarok up, Aluna X, however, both have ran out, now needs to back on a wave, but they do get the kill, that's the important part. Yeah, that'll give them a little bit of a respite and that damage coming in wow. from the ace in the hole. That, that's one of the other strengths on the Bloodthirster. All the things that have AD ratios suddenly have a lot more AD to work on. Oh, mid, his X could be going down. Spirit Rush comes in. Mazarin takes down a second kill. He's trying to get his vengeance for the last game where he didn't get what he wanted overall. But now the question is, what is he going to do with it? The problem is, he used his ultimate. Not going to be able to roam that easily. He's just going to back out. Uh, has got quite a few pots. Will be able to pick up his death fire fairly shortly, I believe. And indeed does so. And now, that is the time that he really wants to be roaming. Again, though... With an Ari this strong, it's difficult to roam against Ziggs because he's got such good wave clear and he will punish you by taking your tower very quickly. However, now with that top tower falling, I think this game is going to start getting a little bit more mobile. It certainly is. I wouldn't be too surprised to see Caitlyn Thresh recall and go to bot now and maybe have Kennen go top so that they can put more presence and pressure on Dragon. Maybe that's not going to be the case. Only time is going to tell. But actually, yep, going to be rejoining top lane. They don't want to lose this tower for free. Death Sentence comes in onto Coralius, but Archie cannot hold off the Onslaught when one versus two. But we've been talking a lot about how big Caitlyn is at top. In mid, it's the complete opposite. Mazarin is crushing Ziggs in terms of kills. So even though one lane is winning, another's losing pretty even overall in this matchup. The only thing to consider in the difference between them is that Ziggs is staying equal on farm. 130 compared to 80 on Sivir. That's another two and a half-ish kills between the two of them. That is really, really scary. 
And uh, I did just receive a little bit of information, actually, that Ari is running, okay, 18, 0, and 12 mastery. Mostly, I think, because of Ari's high mana cost, she wanted the total biscuit of rejuvenation instead of the normal pot, health pots, and that gives her that advantage. Corellius is hanging around, though, on the Wraith camp. This could get really, really bad. This ambush could go well against them. Crowstorm comes in, flashing onto Olgate. Okay, do you have enough damage, though? Spirit Rush comes in. Yes, they do have enough damage, as the ultimate goes in from Zix as well. Lasagna will be paranoiding his way to success after picking up the kill onto Ari. Corellius just backs on away, so one for one overall. Both mid lane is falling, and now suddenly a 3v3 in mid with slightly, I guess, advantage in the favor of. I never give up. That being said, though, Archie's been chased out. MPS lol rotating much quicker than Kennen, who still sat at bot lane. So this actually turning back around in Ultravirus' favor. Yeah, up until that point where they got that last kill there, it was definitely going against them. They lost their kill streak, Ari in return for the, the death streak Ziggs and Caitlyn was in a position to start sieging however due to the fact Power of Dreams didn't have his ultimate he didn't want to roam NBS lol no such problems he was just going to be there and quite happy NBS lol continued to think about going in and he indeed will do. Nocturne has picked up the dragon. Now MBS Lol is going to be ulting in with the dragon's descent. Nocturne should be falling down alongside Shabana, Caitlyn and Sivir. So both AD carries claiming their stake, picking up kills. And that's all she wrote. So dragon plus two kills. However, that does mean now that Ultravires have the opportunity to start pushing in this mid lane. Ziggs, good wave clear, but Mazarin actually tanking that has slowed it down. He just took quite a lot of the AoE away by detonating it a little bit further forward than normal. That hook would have been really, really dangerous if it had landed, though. Yeah, if that hook had landed, not only would it have been potentially engaged from Oligate and also Yunwa, but all the creeps were dead, so you'd have been taking tower damage as well. So, very fortunate from Mazarin's perspective. It did not land on him, and of course, or Karolius, but... The dragon has gone down, so the objective is going to be down for the next few minutes. Where do you see the next action? Because by and large, Wellington, they seem to be matching one another. No one's really looking to push forward, taking towers down. Yeah, the question I think that's going to determine where most of the action is, is where is Caitlyn at any given moment? Because she is a sieging machine, and coupled with Ziggs, that could get really, really difficult. That means that they have to keep this split push going, and MBS Lol is doing that right now. He's shoving out waves very, very quickly because he does that. He's Shivani, he clears waves like they aren't even there. But that does mean that they are kind of committing Caitlyn to that top lane, and she's going to get a lot of farm, so they need to make a play somewhere else while that's going on. Having to deal with the counter push of Ziggs, though, making it difficult. If they could catch one person out, though, that could really convert very easily. Which is very much the way that game number one ended up finishing, is by a couple picks that Ultra Virus actually got themselves. So, this is, a, again, a very, very close matchup between these two. But you can start to see some of the differences coming about with the CS differential. Again, Caitlyn is keeping ahead, although Sivir has picked up kills here and there. Now, 4 and 1. So a lot of that CS differential, Spellington's actually been mitigated purely on kills. Yeah, indeed. That is a, a very, very strong part of Sivir. If you are very mobile, it's always a lot easier to be in the right place at the right time. That enables you to pick up kills. That enables you to recover. Sivir is very good at recovering from a bad laning phase. That was very close for Ari in mid. They may look to fight off the back of this. They're going for it. The box is down. Yes, it is. Here comes Shabana from the side. So this backline destruction team of Olaf and Shabana are trying their best to pick up kills. They've got one. Terrify comes out on six. He's going to be following suit as well from Deadly Brother. He picks up that big kill. Now chasing after Yonwa with the death fire grasp of Mazarin. The Ignite's ticking down as well. Is it going to be enough? No. Narrowly surviving. By the skin of his teeth, had about 40 hit points remaining. Now Protostorm comes down. Karolius has been acing the hold from Caitlyn. Tower falls. Syria picks up a sixth kill. So for all the problems that Deadly Brother had in lane, they've all just disappeared. They've evaporated. He's back. And these are the reasons they've been running Civ here. Very fast wave clear and very fast uh, you know, ability to push towers is nice to have. But the fact that she has now, especially with the changes to Boomerang Blade, relatively high base damage on it, effectively dependent on her AD rather than the actual points in the skill. She is very much able to just be relevant for an AD carry without items, and that is 
very important indeed. They will be backing out now and getting some healing on. But this is the kind of gameplay they wanted to get last game where they were keeping the siege comp from ever grouping up and ever getting where they wanted to be. Now they need to force them back and keep this momentum going. If they start getting forced back, it could go badly for them. They do now have the tools though, especially with Sivir. Oh yeah, Sivir has just gone back to spawn and picked up a few items. So has the components of the Phantom Dancer after taking the Cloak of Agility. And on the flip side, looks as though Caitlyn's going for the Static Shiv. So different build order. Both of them completely viable, of course, but we're seeing more and more often that Static Shiv is being locked in from Caitlyn Spider. I mean, is there a reason why you take Static Shiv over the likes of Phantom Dancer, or is it just personal preference? I think the main re Okay, so there are a couple of minor reasons. For one thing, it helps her with wave clear, which is obviously just a nice thing, especially when Caitlyn already takes almost all the creeps down to, like, maybe a little bit below half health. You get that Static Shiv proc, that helps clear it out. The other thing it does for her is that it's a flat bonus that kind of gives her that little bit more of an edge in that doldrum period for Caitlyn. She's a little bit weaker at the mid-game period, but at the moment, it's uh, you know with that bloodthirster for the flat AD on the L auto attacks, she's kind of waiting for that crit to start becoming a major part of her damage. At the moment, it's not a major part of her damage. She's just relying on the flat magic damage from the static shift and the flat AD from the bloodthirster. When she starts getting a couple more items, they will start to fit together. And the difference between Static Shiv and Phantom Dancer late game isn't that big. The other final point I will make about Static Shiv is that it does accelerate her build. It is a little bit cheaper, and that means she can get the Last Whisper a little bit sooner. However, this push in the bot lane, that's going to be a tower if Deadly Fire stick for. Well, they are looking to bat this one down very quickly. I said this in the previous game, but Sivir is a very good tower pusher because of Ricochet. Gets an attack speed boost with On The Hunt as a passive. So that's one of the reasons why you'll see Sivir chunking through towers very, very quickly, especially with attack speed as well. So got Berserker Greaves and Zeal, of course. That's going to be upping the attack speed on top of everything else. Dragon's up in 10 seconds. Both teams look positioned to try and take this one down. But I wouldn't be too surprised if Ultravires try and get a pick before the Dragon, because this is something we've seen them do a lot. Yeah, indeed. They they are a team that lives and dies on their picking ability and their team fighting ability. So it does look like they're going to force either a team fight or a pick. But are their opponents going for the Baron? No, they're not. They're just, they're just taking raids. It would be a little bit early, perhaps, to go for the Baron, especially considering the enemy team is all alive. However, at the moment, they are actually going to push back. That being never give up. And they are... Start, if they lose this momentum, then they're not going to be able to deal with this really fast push. And you can see all of these lane rotations. See, if they're heading top, they will be on the back foot again and probably lose at least some damage on that top tower. Yep, so while there is a bit of a lull in the action, I'm just going to elaborate on what I meant before about Deadly Brothers' tower pushing capabilities. So, it's it's with On The Hunt, Sivir gains 60% attack speed while Ricochet is active, and Ricochet has a 6 second cooldown. So you're quickly seeing just how good Deadly Brother, just how good Sivir is at bursting towers down very quickly. Is an actual fact pushing top, and again, this is going to have to attract some of those never give up players to go top, otherwise they risk losing this in a tower and it's very difficult to pin him down Sivir with that movement speed from the ultimate if necessary and the spell shield to stop the stuns well how are you going to chase that down unless you are sort of nocturne it's going to be very difficult and even then you don't really have an easy time unless it's a two-on-one situation which Sivir would honestly be a bit of a fool to be caught in so that does mean right now that Sivir is just constantly applying this map pressure and there's very little answer to it uh, there was a little note in chat, by the way. Um, Mazarin saying, how can we see that ward? I don't know which ward they're referring to, but apparently they could see a ward, and there was no real explanation as to why. Um, I'm not too sure, because I, I didn't actually catch that. So maybe it's a case that he's talking about vision wards that are now visible and no longer stealth, but I would, I would assume Mazarin would already know that going into this game. So, bit of an interesting one. I'm not too sure what he was talking about, to be honest. It, I mean, it sounds to me like he's describing a glitch where a, a, a stealth ward would be visible for some bizarro reason that best known only to the minions of Summoner's Rift, which do include wards. So, regardless, it doesn't matter too much. I suspect a single ward one way or the other is 
Not usually going to make a big difference. However, it does look like Archie is looking for a pick in the mid lane. He's not going to get it. The constant rotation in NBS LOL, keeping Caitlyn trapped in that bottom lane, is making it quite difficult for Never Give Up to react. However, they are living up to their name because they have quite good defense against Eve. Death Sentence comes out onto a Luna, but they don't want to jump on top of him. He's way too big. Ricochet, Deadly Brother, plus NBS Long Coralius are looking to pick up this tower. They are going to take it. Are they going to engage? Now, afterwards, Ace Nile comes out. It's going to be easily blocked from NBS Law. So another objective goes down. That's four to one on towers, plus a couple of dragons as well. So it, it's starting to look pretty good for Ultra Vise. I'm not sure how Never Give Up can pull themselves back from this position. Yeah, and remember, ladies and gentlemen, this is the third game in the best of three. So whoever wins this does advance to the round of eight in the We Play Invitational Tournament. It does actually look like there is going to be a revenge push here on the mid lane, but it has to be a very, very dangerous and quick call because are being encircled, the Shirelias, not the Shirelias, has been popped. Talisman Ascension has been popped there. Here comes the re-engage again. Nocturne is going to use his Paranoid to jump back in. Amongst all the action, Power of Dreams is going to go down. 1-1 one, one trade. Make that a 2-1 trade if MBS Law can't get his way outside. Then Archie goes down for the double kill. So Mazarin's looking to absolutely crush. Could be in for his triple. Goes in for his quadra as well. Not going to get the Penta. And for the second time, we get a Penta stolen away. Although that being said, Caitlyn could have actually escaped. So... 5 for 1 trade in Team Fire's favor, looking huge. Suddenly, all of the doubts about Mazarin playing Ari at last game are completely forgotten because he just danced around that fight like a ballerina. Taking down all those members at once was just really beautiful. And especially right at the end, the way he used his last charge of his ultimate, brought himself in W range uh, to take Ziggs down as he was jumping away using the Orb of Deception to get him to force him to jump in only one direction so that w would be uh, getting on tracking on him so nbs lol has apparently disconnected and um it is definitely looking good for ultra Vias right now however messes i believe we have a giveaway today and since it is a pause timer after all would you like to take that away yes uh, sorry i was just cracking up there someone said more ham than a butcher store for Mazarin as he jumped in, but the giveaway is a G300 gaming mouse. So if you want to be put in contention to win that for completely free, it's exclamation mark giveaway in Twitch chat, and it will allow you to know what you need to do next, what the next steps are to pick up the G300. That being said, though, Spud, we're still in the pause, and I'm not too sure what's happening. Just uh, I think the one player left, didn't they? Yeah, apparently it's NBS lol that died. So uh, I. <laughs> Yes, he's. Uh, uh, if, if it turns out he's dead, I'm now going to look really suspicious. Um, it is NBS LOL who has disconnected. Uh, we're not entirely sure what the cause is. Um, so I guess we've got nothing to do but to simply wait and hope he will return. At the moment, though, it is definitely looking like he is, is favoured in this game. Indeed, almost to an extent where you could argue for a 4v5 victory even if he didn't come back. Uh, definitely a definitely an advantage and there isn't much answer to that style they've been playing that rotation especially if they manage to take the inhibitor tower off this push yeah definitely the case and after that five for one trade that we just saw before with a quadra kill for Mazarin not only is it a case of oh we just crushed them five to one lots of gold going in the back pocket now of Mazarin who's got 2.1k to spend 3.5 on NBS lol who has just reconnected and it looks as though this is going to be a free inhib tower and potentially the inhibitor afterwards because you've got 10 second respawn timers on Caitlyn, Ziggs and also Nocturne so we should have the unpause coming up pretty soon yeah NBS is asking if we are ready yes indeed he's not asking us however he's asking the other team because this is three minutes in the past spooky 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 and I've got to say actually though by the way one of the problems that I feel is being suffered here by Never Give Up is the Power of Dreams is not nearly as comfortable on Kennen as he is in his previous two champions that he's been playing, uh, which I believe was Renekton and Siobhan. If not, it was Renekton and Renekton. I can't remember. But, no, it was Renekton and Shen. Um, Renekton 
on that reaction, we saw him get a quadra. We saw him engage really, really hard. And he was really, really good at being in the right place at the right time, doing his timing pushes. However, with Kennen thus far, he's had several problems. He's been deleted in several fights before he manages to do anything. Partly in the fact due, uh, due to the fact he still does not have a Zonya's Hourglass. And he also had a weaker laning phase. He was not able to really shut down Shivana very hard. Yes, he's a little bit ahead on CS, but Shivana is having a lot of influence in these fights by diving onto the back line. So you've got to say right now, Metas, Power of Dreams kind of needs to, well, step it up. This is going to be his opportunity to do that, though. He will pick up his Zonyas now. Yeah, I think once the Zonyas is uh, picked up on Kennen, it's going to be much more aggressive plays, jumping into the back lines on the likes of Siva, on the likes of uh, Mazarin as well. well. Mazarin's playing very aggressive this time. That's the main difference I've noticed between his team star play in games two and three, where he's used Ari. Game two, he was fairly passive, fairly unconfident in the ability to jump in and pick up kills, but this time around he is going so, so aggressive and he's being rewarded with that in kind. With the um, the Kennen ultimate though, the Slicing Maelstrom and also the Zonia's Hourglass, it's probably going to be a lot more difficult because he's going to look to try and stun away players and also do a lot of damage on top of that, but I can't help but feel at Spunnington that the damage has already been done. His team are already a long way behind, so he went through Bizzle Scepter first and in doing so, yes, he's doing quite a bit of damage, but he wasn't that terrifying Kennen that people loathe the play against yeah he still has that potential for lockdown and they still have quite a lot of aoe damage which could really really hurt um hurt ultra buys if they were to catch them in it without being caught themselves by for instance shivana and crowstorm together if they were able to catch fiddlesticks and then get an aoe composition fight that could work for them but they just don't seem to be able to make it work for them right now. They are going to be seeding another dragon here. That is going to be a nice little take there. 10k gold now we're pretty much at. And that's the point where we start to think, ooh, how do you cope with that? How do you fight on five a team that's that far ahead of you? And Meta's, honestly, I'm not even sure they're going to be able to defend this inhibitor. Yeah, it's not looking good for them. Even with his on his hour glassed up cannon, it's just not really enough damage because they've got very tanky champions in the form of Shabana and Olaf that can tower dive or indeed just go to the very back lines and crush through Caitlyn. Had a really blisteringly good early game, but it's starting to get to the point now where it's, it's quite scary. Tower's of extension has been used here from both support. Shabana jumping in with Dragon Sense. This actually could be all she wrote if they win this cleanly. It's going to be the GG. Ari goes in, kills Kenneth, doesn't even use the Zonya's hourglass. So that's a huge, big deal actually from Never Give Up, who are 3-0 down. Archie's going to be falling past the fountain. In fact, will he as Mazarin will die? And they get the shutdown goal, but still, they've got the inhibitor and they're looking to push these Nexus Towers. Yeah, they're very low on health, but I honestly don't feel like Archie can stop them here. He's going to give it a go. He's walking up towards them, actually. No, he isn't. He's just going to kind of walk up to them and attack and flay, maybe. Or maybe Death Sentence Alan onto the spawn pad, who kind of jittered in place rather than going somewhere when you played him. Regardless though, guys, that is the third game of the best of three going in the favor of Ultra Vias in quite a narrow contest there. Both teams really did equip themselves very well indeed. But that is uh, going to be Ultra Vias advancing. I cannot remember the names today. Ultra Vias advancing onto the round of eight. Metas, what are your thoughts on this game? Well, I think the best team won overall. Um... Ultra Vias consistently were the best teams in team fights, but that game number two, when a, a spanner was thrown in the works of Ultra Vias, all came around that Nidalee pick. It just came from those constant spears just flying through and chunking players down left, right, and center. As soon as they banned that out, I feel a lot of the power, a lot of the presence out of Never Give Up kind of fell by the wayside. The Ziggs finished 0 and 6. So you're going from a, a player who pretty much carried his team in game number two to going zero and six in mid. It goes to show the massive changes that we saw between those two matchups. And I think that's ultimately what this came down to. Yeah, it was smart play to win the second game, but the sheer team fighting ability is the one that won out. But regardless, guys, 
There will be another best of three coming up in a second. In the meantime, if you want to enter into this yeah, into this giveaway for the G300 gaming mouse from Logitech, then we will uh, be showing you some instructions on in how to enter that, which I believe mostly consists of going to a Facebook page and posting something there. Uh, if you are interested, the instructions can be found by typing exclamation mark giveaway, although there is only we only a necessity to put one usage of that down. I have a funny feeling we may have some spam in a second. However, though, that is it from me today. If you have enjoyed my casting, you can follow me on my Twitter or my Facebook, twitter.com forward slash Spuddington and facebook.com forward slash Spuddington casts. I believe we will be seeing Metas again later, along with Pulse, which uh, the next best of three is due to start very soon.